Welcome to the What I Learned. I got a chance to interview Adam Jason and Cole Shepard and really talk into some nuanced finance details. It was kind of a, a, a nerdy uh, finance talk, which I personally really, really enjoy. Uh, I met Adam and Cole, uh, shoot, six, nine months ago. Uh, I was in Puerto Rico. I was trying to buy uh, some hotels from them and their portfolio company. Uh, ultimately, that portfolio sold before I made it into town into, into Puerto Rico. Subsequently, uh, I invested into their uh, green coffee company, which is uh, now the second largest coffee producer in Colombia. Uh, but they also, this is their, their parent company and what they do in their day job is develop or invest into venture capital and kind of a private equity structure down in Latin America or in specifically in, in Colombia and Medellin. We got a chance to dive into a lot of different details. And uh, one of the things that uh, sh you know struck to me was you know, Adam is a kid from upstate New York or, or you know, over in Ithaca and Buffalo uh, that ended up becoming a securities attorney and, and working down in Texas. And he's staring down the uh, pipeline of becoming a partner in a law firm. For lawyers out there, they know this is a an interesting uh, path, you know, oftentimes it's a decade amount of work plus 80, 100 hour billing, you know, and, and to get this financial freedom of becoming a partner in, in a big law firm. He was staring at that opportunity as, do I want to go down that, you know, route and dedicate the next decade of my life to achieving this partner uh, salary and position in, in this law firm. Subsequently, he took a hiatus and spent some time down in Colombia and was like, I just think there's a, a better way of living. And he took an alternative path. And really, I've talked to this in the past of this one way or two way opportunities. But the the opportunity was, he could go and live in Colombia for a small period of time, if he didn't like it, he could come back. Now so it's four years later and he's had this tremendous amount of opportunity. He's be, been able to significantly increase his net worth. He's been, a va uh, uh, you know, had the opportunity to learn Spanish. He got married, you know, he's living down there and it's just this alternative path that is much more fulfilling in his life because he took it, this option. Cole, kid from uh, North Carolina and was really interested in finance. He used to grade like his baseball cards, like Cal Ripken is better than Ken, Rippey, Ken Griffey Jr. You know, so then, but then what happens is he transitioned into college and then ranking ETFs or stocks. Uh, with a limited amount of money, he at least was ranking that. He got into uh, PwC, uh, and, and worked uh, as a global M&A team, doing stuff in Bermuda, Hong Kong, and then Beijing, and then really took the opportunity to, as a gunslinger and a you know, opportunistic investor, is traded out on his, cashed out all his IRA, cashed out his, his accounts, and moved to Colombia to start physically trading commodities and investing into to the wild, wild west, or really the south uh, of Latin America. And when we look at this is Latin America, geographically positioned, geographically saying south of the United States, um, and as a land mass and a population mass, which I found super, super interesting, is almost equivalent to China meaning there's about 750 million people in Latin America as a whole. Their GDP is equal to China today. So in comparison, if we're looking at Latin America or China, they're actually 
as a whole comparable or very comparable in the size of people and the production of GDP. When I have this overarching macro thesis is that there are some challenges between the East and the West. China and the US, you know, the turmoil started maybe with Trump's and some of the tariffs and back and forth. You know, there's current things going on in Hong Kong. There's always some tensions around Taiwan right now. Maybe, you know, there are high level of uh, behind the scenes digital warfare from IP and stealing. And, and let's be honest, China has been a world power for thousands of years. They feel like they've just had a bad century. They've kind of stepped and stubbed their toe. They have a bad century and they're now trying to reposition themselves in global dominance for the coming millennia. Obviously, United States is the superpower that is uh, has taken that role in that last century and doesn't necessarily want to give that up. As the, the turmoil and trepidation and back and forth you know, plays out over the next decade, I believe, and this goes back to my macro thesis that I believe the United States is going to need to become a lot more friendly. North America and South America are going to need to buddy up to combat the uh, push for remaking the world under the lens of China. So when that resources uh, mining in Peru and Chile and, uh, you know, uh, lithium ion, you know, uh, human capital, just capital and resources in general. And when I look at that and talking to Adam and Jason is it's highlighting how much Latin America is just primed for a huge amount of explosion in investment capital. They are considered emerging markets you know, looking at Mexico, looking at its its geographic positioning, like for instance, Mexico has both the Pacific Coast and the East Coast. They have a pretty developed infrastructure of, of rail and they can move things around. They have pretty decent road systems. Colombia is an ally of South America and South America to the United States. And so it becomes this foothold and I see the opportunities in Latin America are tremendous and spending time in a lot of these Spanish speaking countries in Latin America is the culture and the quality of people is unbelievable. It's so exciting and so vibrant. And I just, again, looking at the next 10, 20 years, I'm very, very excited for Latin American uh, culture and investment moving forward and getting a chance to dive into some of the nuanced details that are happening that Adam and Cole are get to discuss is, for instance, their Polygonus company. Polygonus is a high level software engineers and digital artist. And really that is unlocking this, this NFT world. Let's, let's be honest, NFTs are going to remake the entire world, the business world as a whole and create kind of a, a next level uh, version of business. Think about this right now, as far as right to do a venture capital, to raise uh, seed funding, to raise you know angel to seed to series A uh, is, is challenging, difficult. There's a lot of people looking for a lot of, um, you know, funds to go out there. NFTs are a platform in which you can bring your end consumer forward that you don't have to necessarily give up the same equity stake that you would to a VC. And this is where I think it's also NFTs are scary is there's a lot of hype there's a lot of you know craziness going around NFTs, um, and what is going to really play out is kind of like the dot com era. Is ninety percent, ninety nine percent of these NFT projects are just going to go to nothing. They're going to be worthless. There is no utilitarian value. Very little collectability value. 
just like in the dot-com era, when you put dot-com on anything, it was able to raise funds, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. No, oh, it's the internet, it's a new thing. And most of them fizzled out to nothing. But during that time, those that built good businesses, amazon.com got built in 99. They built a platform company in the dot-com era that has now obviously, you know, in 2022 transcend is one of the most valuable companies in the world. And Jeff Bezos is, you know, uh, nip and tuck as the richest person in the world, depending on what the stock market is doing today. I also believe that the same thing is going to happen with NFTs. There will be platforms, businesses that get built off of an NFT platform that will remake the world and become some of the most valuable companies into the future. And the fact like a polygonist is it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your pedigree. It doesn't matter the school you went to. It is all and completely rewarded on whether or not you can really do the work. What's exciting about this and what Adam and Jason are doing is you have this young, hungry, capitalistic mentality approach to Medellin, Colombia, and the, these workers are getting a, a, a chance to grow up in a digitally native environment and create renders, create video games, create video games in the NFT world. And, and the biggest NFT project probably is not going to be US based in the next few years. Maybe it's in Asia, maybe it's in South America, maybe it's a Spanish speaking NFT, you know, platform and, and product overall is, I mean, it's, it's, it's literally remaking the entire world. And let me give you just an example of some of the NFTs where I see the possibility this going. Let's say for instance, I buy a ticket to a basketball game. The NBA, I'm in the United States. Uh, I, I, I'm in San Antonio, I buy a, a Spurs tickets and it's court size and the ticket is as $500 from the Spurs directly. And then using an NFT, if this is via an NFT uh, version of the ticket is it's built into the smart contract is that every time that ticket is resold, the Spurs get a 10% commission royalty fee. And so if I decide to scalp it or sell that ticket, because maybe I don't want to go to the game or, you know, maybe it's the, the, the warriors are coming in and, and Steph Curry's playing and he's on a hot streak. And so somebody wants to buy it for 600 bucks. So I sell it for 600 bucks. The Spurs, get that extra 10%. So they initially sold it for 500 before I would just pocket that hundred bucks and you know, they discouraged that. But now I see how the Spurs would encourage people selling it because they get an extra 60 bucks on that increase of that price because it's the 10% of the overall price. So I net a little bit less as the seller, but the Spurs make more. So say that guy, you know, that buys it from me, buys, resells it for $700. So again, $70 goes back to the Spurs because there's a 10%. He makes the little differential and then it goes to 80 or 90, you know, uh, 800, 900, $1,000. That $1,000 and each time that transact and, and trades before the actual event happens creates revenue additional royalties to the Spurs. And so now they've made significantly more money off that $500 ticket because it transact and was worth more money. Subsequently, even if it sells for less, if it, it sold for $400, they would make $40. If it sold for $300, it's, you know, they make $30. So they've made more money and that's how the, the mechanisms of the NFTs are really, really interesting moving forward. And so if you were to take that, well, now what happens if the Spurs give those NFT holders like some exclusive artwork or video rights, maybe video rights based on their seats thing is they get, you know, sure, certain, you know, video, um, you know, royalty rights to, you know, Steph Curry's, you know, the entire game. Now let's say Steph Curry goes for a hundred points. 
101 points. He breaks Wilt Chamberlain's record. The most points ever scored in a game because he just goes crazy. Now that ticket, the game that you got to go to, that you're super excited about, that you got to experience IRL in real life, now has a lot more collectability value to it because there's also increased utilitarian value in the future is access to specific artwork or maybe only those NFT holders can get digital art from Steph Curry, a digital signature or a digital NFT project of the 101 point game. And so it's like, wow, whoever owns that, that ticket's worth way more money. Or maybe it's even exclusivity to the video rights and you get royalties off that video right. And so it's actually paying you back. Your NFT is paying you money back every time that video clip is played over and over and over and over again. The Spurs are also getting in on that. You're getting in on that as the NFT holder. And now what has happened is that continues to trade time and time and time and time and time again. Think about how many times a baseball card has been traded over its 20, 30, 40, 50 year life expectancy or you know the, the collectability of that many, many times. And so just like that, that one ticket stub, NFT call it, can be traded over and over and over and over and over again over a 10 year time period that at once the Spurs only made $500 on that initial sell. And that was it. Now all of a sudden, as it grows in to forever, they may make 50,000, 100,000, hundreds of thousands of dollars off of that one ticket times an entire arena times however many home games that they have. That to me is like what is so crazy about NFTs is like it's just unlocking so much more potential and value in every single aspect of life. And that's also now combined with like the metaverse is how do people interact with the world? And now it just, it's a matter of connecting with the internet. And so those opportunities that are lying out there are unbelievable unbelievable like it's it's just it's like it's even hard to fathom that's what i was talking about with adam jason and cole shepherd is is it's hard to even fathom the possibilities and it's like it may change in three months from now because of the the way technology advances is that it just continues to go and go and go and go and and the possibilities are are completely endless and then i wanted to finish up with one of the last things that I really learned from the interview with Cole and Adam was how Latin America is probably the freest geographic, the freest that anyone is on planet Earth right now in 2022. Freest. The, the virtues and the, the premise that helped found the United States, freedom, the ability to just make your own way in life, a principle of the United States. And now all of a sudden you see more and more of those personal freedoms is being infringed upon all the time. And you look at things like COVID, like this pandemic, you know, what's going on in Canada, what's going on in Australia, what's going on in the United States, you have just craziness. And let's be honest, they're infringing on certain freedoms. However, Latin America is so dependent on tourism and, and, and low friction of, of access. It's the freest place in the world right now. You don't need a COVID vaccine card, you don't need a, a up-to-date um, PCR test to go into the grocery store to buy food, have you know your kids masked up. And so wherever you sit on this, and I don't care if you you know believe in COVID, you don't believe in COVID, you you know say, hey, here's the science. I don't really care where you are in in this um, debate or but from a standard of Latin America, they are the freest group of people that exist on this planet, you know, right now. Right or wrong, uh, they are the most free group of people on the planet. 
And like I or said earlier, the cultural components of them is this hustle, the food, the vibrancy, the have fun, you know, and now that capitalism is becoming, you know, more and more prominent in each one of these cultures is, is so exciting to see. So awesome to see people like Adam and Cole just really, really building this out and, and relocating and moving out of the States. One of the questions that, that Adam has asked is, when are you moving back? And he's like, I don't know if I will. I love my life. I, it is, I have almost nothing that I am missing living in Colombia. It's a developed country, you know, good health care, access to the same internet. I can watch the same games. I'm on the Eastern, or actually I think they're on Central Time Zone. So it's like all of those things that people would uh, associate with being in the United States, he has those in Colombia, but it's at one quarter of the cost. That's what I see moving forward Costa Rica, Colombia, Mexico, uh, you know, and, and obviously these are caveats of where you actually are living, have just a higher, higher quality of life at a lower price point or equal quality of life at a lower price point. Sometimes there may be ups and downs, but let's say you live in Chicago. Is it less, you know, violent in Chicago than it is in, in Mexico? Yeah, all depends on what neighborhood you're in. There are very nice neighborhoods in, in Mexico City, um, and there are not nice neighborhoods in the United States. So it all really, really depends. I think that is the information age that we're in, and Latin America is really, really well positioned to take advantage over the next 10, 20 years of the reshuffling of NFTs, the metaverse, Web 3.0, and just the ability to, you know, get things done. And that is super, super excited for, uh, for me, as well as Adam and, and Cole and so many things that are happening in Colombia and Latin America as a whole. It has, has me fired up just even thinking about it and, and how exciting that is going to be um, for everyone in that region. Again, this is a wrap up of what I learned from interviewing Adam and Cole with the Catching Knives podcast show. If you want to catch their full episode, there's links to that down below in the blog. You know, I don't know if it's in YouTube. And so it's up here in the corner, wherever you're viewing this, there are access to that full form interview. Uh, it goes long, but we, again, talk nerdy, a lot of finance stuff and emerging markets, how to invest or how they invested into it. And it is an exciting episode Look for it wherever you find podcasts. Thanks, guys. Have a fantastic afternoon and evening. Uh -huh.